what a fabulous group this is. Thank you, thank you, Amanda and Lucas. It is a thrill and a total delight for me to be in such a stellar lineup for such a wonderful cause. Okay, so here we go. God, I hope the clonopin has kicked in. <laughs> Salute to the tapeworm. Okay, I know, a tapeworm, get over it, okay, but. Writers need to somehow get hooked by the inner lives of those they write about, to find a compelling reason to stay through something, the long, horrible slog of actually getting a book to happen. So my question for you all is, how do you and all the writers in the room fall in love with your future subject? Let me set the scene. March 2020. Exactly three years ago, this very week, in our greatest city and in the, our greatest hospital, New York Presbyterian, no one is prepared for what was coming at us like a rocket. Yeah, right? Like a certain little overwhelming medical mystery and a catastrophe that descended on the planet. So, you know, as a reporter, certain stories just have to be told. And when I heard about this opportunity to go backstage at New York Presbyterian in the sort of the final moments of the, of the first surge and stay through it through the next six or eight months, I could not wait to get inside with these medical gladiators to try to figure out how they rode the dragon. So you've heard of the expression getting inside a story, well, this gives this, this coming story gives this an entirely new meaning. In this case, the device I used was at first glance absolutely gross. Let's go to the slide. The lowly tapeworm became my North Star, that wretched parasite that we dread almost more than any other infestation. So, back to the future. <laughs> I know what you're thinking, how can I get the hell out of the door? But just consider the humble tapeworm in all its beauty. In Latin, tina soleum. The tina soleum, in certain circles, is the Louis B. Mayer of parasites. The star maker who was responsible for realigning the molecules of our greatest medical detectives. So this is the story of how the tapeworm, the tina soleum, became the creator of illustrious careers. So, back to the future. The year is 1970, the place Cornell Medical School, the beating heart of the medical elite establishment of New York City's Upper East Side. The mayor is the urbane dreamboat, John Lindsay, who often appeared in his Bermuda shorts at the recently opened Baskin Robbins, a first in the city and in the nation. That summer, my first in New York, Vietnam protests took over Central Park. Thousands of women burned their bras on Fifth Avenue. The air was perfumed with pot. It was glorious. But at P Cornell Medical School at 68th and York, the almost all-male class in their bass regions and navy blazers, these boys were cramming for their medical boards and they, I, they idolized a showboat of a doctor, a brilliant guru of parasites with a mahogany tan. Meet Ben Keen, then and now the most improbable North Star of the pandemic of 2020. How to describe him? Doctors can no longer write the name-dropping memoirs that Ben Keen used to routinely churn out nor, since the advent of HIPAA, talk about, as Keen frequently did, his patient Salvador Dali's chronic stomach agonies. But Keen was a man of charisma with a celebrated wife, the dancer and arts patron Rebecca Harkness. He was a showman. But most of all, he was a pathologist extraordinaire who punched his ticket during the war in the canal zone, finding the rarest of creatures in his laboratory. After the war, he was rewarded by the army who dispatched him to Berlin 
to chase down all the counterfeit penicillin that was killing all of the soldiers who took it. But enthralled by these mysterious creatures who lived in the gut, he, made his, he soon made his way to New York City to rocket to glory on the Upper East Side when he discovered the bug that was the cause of Teresta. By the 1960s, he was reigning over the digestive tracts of the rich and the famous who made their way to his Park Avenue office. He had his own mythic laboratory at New York Hospital where he presided over, oh my God, all of the digestion, all the, of the digestion of everyone from Oscar Hammerstein to Gertrude Lawrence. And a famous story, he once saved Gertrude Lawrence's larynx by taking a train to New Haven for the opening night of The King and I when she was felled by laryngitis. He became the ruling Pasha of New York Hospital, now known as Wild Cornell, which is, of course, the emerald city of medical care of New York Presbyterian. Who hasn't been treated there? Jackie Onassis, the Shah of Iran, presidents and prime ministers, all could be found in its VIP suites overlooking the East River. I would venture to guess that three quarters of this room has been treated at New York Hospital. But not only was Keene was Keen a genius medical detective, he was as well a charismatic bon vivant who would regale his patients and all of his medical students with the latest parasite news he had extracted from Cuban sugar barons. On the podium at the medical school, he would take to the podium wearing this incredible navy blue velvet blazer. He always brought his, his Westie on a leash and he was incredibly always smoking a cigar in the middle of the medical school as he lectured. So one day, this extraordinary rumor begins circulating through the medical school. Dr. Keene had extracted a record-breaking tapeworm from the digestive tract of a South American uranium king. <laughs> 30 feet. What? Everyone in the medical was saying, that's impossible. Another one of Dr. Keene's preposterous mythic tales. How long could this tapeworm be? No one before 1970 had ever extracted a tapeworm of this dimension. Not only had this been expelled from a uranium king, but it was right now draped on the sofa in the patient's baronial suite being admired by a group of the uranium king's millionaire cronies, or so went the story around the hospital. But another story went around. Even more thrilling, Keen was said to be bringing the famous tapeworm to that week's tropical disease lecture for the entire medical school to admire. So on the day of the lecture, a crowd forms in the halls. The medical schools, is just packed, and the residents are pushing their way in to fight over the seats. They are literally diving for the seats in the auditorium. And who was in the hall that day fighting for a seat? Who else but the tough-minded, young chief resident, Tony Fauci? <laughs> the residents, true story. The residents and, the residents and in interns were already so intimidated by the already apparent genius of the diminutive Fauci that when he would come in, people would kind of like, you know, they would scurry around. He took no prisoners, then and now, and when it was about the rigor of medical care. If a case was complicated, young Dr. Fauci would appear at the door with the kind of cowering interns and medical students, and he would say to them, Okay, everyone, out, I'm taking over. That day, Ben Keen did not disappoint. There, along with his Westie and the cigar and the Navy blazer, was the 30-foot worm in its proper lab beaker. Not long after, young Tony Fauci went down the chute to his medical future to start his astonishing career at the National Institute of Health and so many others of Ben Keen's all-stars became our nation's most eminent virus detectives, including the current emeritus head of tropical medicine at Weill Cornell, who first told me the story when I started my reporting. Keen stayed in touch with all of them, 
and he helped them figure out AIDS and a puzzle piece that he brought to that incredible tragedy that extended back to his work in the villages of Haiti. And as spring 2020 rolled into New York, Keene was sadly gone, but his successors found themselves once again confronting a great unknown as confounded and exhilarated and in awe of all that lay ahead of them as everything that had come before. Woo.